Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Steve Eady. I'm the Manager of Policy for Children, Youth and Families at the Department of Local Government and Communities. Um, it's my gr very great pleasure to welcome you here to the John Curtin Theatre this evening. Um, thank you so much for, for being here and uh, thank you for your patience with uh, some of the uh, parking challenges this evening. So uh, my apologies in advance. I'd like to start now by uh, acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their uh, elders, both past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge Honourable, Honourable Tony Simpson, MLA, the Minister for Local Government, Community Services, Seniors and Volunteering and Youth, uh, Acting Commissioner for Children and Young People, Jenny Perkins, and our special guest uh, this evening, Dr Michael Unger. Uh, tonight's seminar is part of the, uh, the Commissioner's Thinker in Residence program, which was established in 2011 by the inaugural uh, Commissioner, I guess really to raise the, um, the profile and the, uh, and the quality of the debate about the well-being of children and young people. Uh, the Commissioner holds an independent office and reports directly to the West Australian Parliament, um, and her role is to improve the well-being of the over 540,000 children and young people in this state. I guess how, how she does that is by consulting and working in partnership with children and young people, their families, uh, the community, and with government. This year's thinker in residence is Dr. Michael Unger, and tonight he'll share with you um, uh, some stories, some advice, and uh, hopefully a little reassurance about the children and young people in your lives. And I guess his, his two weeks residency here in Western Australia really builds upon his visit um, to Perth in October last year when he delivered uh, two uh, seminars to parents and practitioners uh, during Children's Week. Um, suffice to say that in addition to uh, a number of other organisations, the Department of Local Government and Communities is a very proud sponsor of the Commissioner's Thinker in Residence program. Uh, shortly I'll invite Minister Simpson to say a few words. Um, and then followed by Dr Unger's keynote address. Um, there'll then be an opportunity to ask some questions of, of Dr Unger. Can I, um, we'll have uh, roving microphones uh, at the standby to support you asking the questions that you're uh, burning to ask. Um, can I ask that the questions please be of a, a general nature? Um, if, to wish, if you wish to raise something that's really quite personal with a great deal of detail and backstory, um, there's an opportunity after the event um, with representatives from a number of the community sector organisations that you would have passed in, in the foyer. Um, and I'd just like to thank WACOS for organising for them to be here this evening as we've got representatives from Communicare, Family Daycare Association, Wansley, Nagala, Uniting Care West, Yakwa, Centre Care, Playgroup WA, Rua and Child Australia. Um, so I really encourage you to seek their advice as well before leaving this evening. Now, hopefully before you sat down, you'll have noticed some orange bags on your seats. Uh, in there you'll find uh, a range of information and advice from the Department of Local Government and Communities on a range of topics um, such as cyber safety, coping skills resilience, um, children in electronic games and the like. Um, so there's a great deal of other information on the department's website at dlgc.wa.gov.au. Um, alternatively, just by Googling Parenting WA. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Minister Simpson to open tonight's seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's great to be here this evening. Can I start off with some acknowledgements this evening and Jenny Perkins, Commissioner for Children and Young People, uh, Dr Michael Unger, and ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here. Um, I suppose I can start off by thanking you for taking an interest in raising children. It certainly is a, a challenging world we live in as a father of two teenage daughters. And oh my God, has the world changed since I was raised as a kid. Those challenges are out there for us today and how we deal with the social impact of life, how we deal with all those things between the circle of friends they keep to the circle of friends they have at school and everything else they do in between. I think the government's very supportive in this, in this hemisphere where we are today and also in talking about raising children as the Minister for Communities but also as the Minister for Youth. It's very important that we have a good framework around youth today. 
I think I could use the analogy that children and young children today have the best opportunities than ever before. And sometimes I have problems trying to make them see that, especially my own daughters. But we'll work through that process. The important part, I suppose, for us is our parents, but also uh, developing those young minds for our future leaders and working on those areas of self-confidence, having the uh, right ability to uh, recognise what's around them and also shape them into the future they'll be. A couple of acknowledgements tonight and the fact that um, the Commissioner and Jenny Perkins and the work that she's done, my Department of uh, Local Government and Communities have brought it all together. A raft of sponsors have helped uh, with the uh, residents and thinking behind that, that uh, program. There's a number of uh, supporters. For all them, I thank them for their ongoing support for this program. Can I uh, sit back with you tonight and enjoy and listen to Michael's um, wisdom or thought and hopefully we can all take away some lessons tonight. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, our special guest uh, comes all the way from Canada tonight. Uh, Dr. Michael Unger is a Killam Professor of Social Work at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. Uh, he's the founder and co-director of the Resilience Research Centre, and he's also currently director of the Children and Youth in Challenging Context Network. Um, the Resilience Research Centre coordinates more than $5 million in funded research in over a dozen countries, a significant effort. Dr Unger has practised for 25 years as a social worker and a family therapist, and he's a prolific author on parenting advice and resilience. Uh, during his res residency in Western Australia, Dr Unger has been discussing findings from a number of successful evidence-based programs um, in Canada and working with West Australian practitioners and parents um, to apply his work to the specific needs of our children and, and young people. Um, could you please give a warm welcome to the 2014 Thinker in Resident, Dr Michael Unger. Good evening. Thank you very, very much for the, uh, this opportunity, uh, Minister, as well as uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People. This is a, a real honour to, uh, to be able to do this. Um, and thank you all of you for, uh, for turning up. Um, when it's, a, it's an interesting one when you get an introduction like that. Of course, you're, you know, there's an assumption of this great expertise when, in fact, you know, I often learn the most just from the kids I, and families with whom I'm working, which I'm sure you, you, you might well be able to, uh, to understand. A while back, I began to sort of notice this pattern or I began to sort of wonder about our own children because and, and, I get to travel all over the world and I get to see kids in all kinds of different contexts. And I, I was kind of just sort of, you know, curious what it is that actually would help our children to, um, to be less self-centered. Because that's often a complaint I hear from parents, you know. Oh, our children are, you know, this, this, this generation just thinks about their own, uh, you know, their own stuff. They're never sort of thinking about everyone else. And I was doing a lot of work on resilience and it was very clear to me that, that there was this link there somehow. So I work as a clinician as well as a researcher and I'm still very involved with families and I began to sort of muse on some ideas and, and over time what I did was I sort of brought some of my research findings back into my clinical practice and a while back I had the really interesting good fortune to meet a family that really impressed me, that sort of taught me a lot about this notion of sort of thinking, uh, getting our kids to, to think more about we rather than just about themselves. It was a, a it's a single a story of a single mom, and she has uh, two uh, she had two daughters, a 14 year old and an 11 year old. And what was what was interesting about the situation was the parents had separated a little while before, and and mom was really uh, uh, wrestling to sort of you know raise her two daughters and do it as well as she could. Now the interesting thing was when the daughters were over at the dad's place, he lived sort of on the other side of the city. Um, his, his ways were sort of a little bit more self-centered, to be fair. And I could have, I'm just not going to pick on dads in this case. It just happens to be that this, this is the, the true story here. But dad, you know, dad sort of did things like if the girls were over at his place, well, and they had like an iPod or any kind of clothing, those things had to stay at his place. And the girls could never take them back to their mother's. So that was sort of the house rules and stuff, and the girls kind of navigated back and forth as best they could. A until eventually, one day, Dad let the girls know that, you know, by the way, in about six weeks, I'm going to be leaving. I got a job overseas, I'm off, and that's that. And I think the, the, the youngest one was 
really, you know, quite upset about her father just kind of leaving and, 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 and doing all kinds of, you know, just kind of like that instantly. And what was more, he told her, well, since you have all the stuff at my house, of course, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to sell it because you can't take it to your mom's. And, you know, he sold the iPods and the clothing and the dresses and the shoes and everything else. And that, that was sort of his way of, of just kind of, you know, saying, I'm not going to let you, your mother have that stuff. So there's no way you're taking it over there. And it even was, he got to the point of the point that he, he had bought his 11-year-old daughter a puppy for her last birthday. And, of course, because he was leaving, well, the puppy couldn't go back to mom's. And so, therefore, he took the, the puppy back to the SPCA where he'd gotten it. And, I mean, needless to say, the daughter wasn't too happy about all this. And she began to act out, as kids will, and signal that they're un upset. And what she was doing was she wasn't coming home after school. And her mom worked in quite a low-paying job. And, you know, taking a phone call from her, from her, you know, she wanted the kids to phone her so that she'd be reassured that they were, that she knew where they were. But they weren't. Anyways, the younger one was just disappearing after school, which, of course, worried her a great deal. And the result was that then she'd have to take time off work and she couldn't work the same number of shifts and all this kind of stuff. So it was a really big stress. And potentially, the daughter's behavior was actually um, uh, jeopardizing the economic well-being of the whole family because if mom couldn't work and she was worried about her daughter and she was taking, taking shifts away and all this kind of stuff, the family could actually lose their housing. So again, you know, there's huge consequences. Anyways. Long and the short of it was, all of this was unfolding just before Christmas. Um, and the mom wanted to make up for the girls what they had lost before. And in spe specifically, she wanted to buy the girls new iPods. Not the little tiny ones, but the, you know, the more expensive, the bigger the touches or whatever they're called. And so she was working extra shifts as best she could to try and earn the extra money. Now, around this time, because the daughter wasn't coming home and she was getting really worried, she eventually came to me as the mental health therapist and said, could you help me fix, fix my daughter, especially the younger one, because I'm really worried and I, I, this stress is killing me sort of thing. Anyways, we worked together a little bit and I could never really get the 11-year-old to understand what she was doing, that the impact of her, in a sense, selfish behavior was having on her mother and ultimately the whole family. And eventually I sort of said to her, it seems like you're living out your dad's rules. There seems to be two sets of rules. Your mom knocks herself out. She's the giving, the, the we thinking, the, you know, the everything's for everybody else. And your dad's rules seem to be everything about him. And I didn't say it quite that harshly, but that was sort of what I was hinting at. And, and she kind of wouldn't sort of pick it up. It didn't seem to make any sense to her yet. So Christmas was coming. And mom asked the girls, because she was knocking herself out, she said, look, honey, would you just do the decorating of the tree? Would you just set the house up? It would take you two hours, you two girls, right? Just do that for me. I'll do all the baking. I'll get everything else ready for you. And just, could you just decorate the house? And she made it very clear that that was the one thing that would make her Christmas special. She just wanted the house to feel warm and comfortable and decorated, which is really common, in, 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 certainly in, in Canada where I'm from. Well, long and the short of it is, as we would have expected, and I was sort of anticipating this with the mom, I said to the mom, well, these girls, you know, they're not really thinking we, like you want them to think we. And it, what's going to happen Christmas Eve if they haven't done what you asked them to do, which was to decorate the house? And mom sort of had that, you know, sort of pause, and she sighed. And then she said, well, I'll just do it. After they go to sleep, if it's not done, I'll do it. And I suggested to her, that you handle it a little bit differently. And this is actually what happened. That evening, she asked the girls again, would they please decorate the house? And they were too busy with their homework and their Facebook pages and everything else, and they weren't paying attention. They went to bed, and mom, just as she was about to pull the boxes out of the, out of the, 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 the basement and begin to set everything up for the girls so they'd have this perfect Christmas morning, she paused, and she thought about our conversation, and she decided not to. She left the house completely bare, she didn't decorate the trees, and there was no ha garlands hanging from anywhere and stuff. And in fact, it looked a little bit like the Grinch who stole Christmas, that type of thing. Now, the only thing that she did, though, was she had the iPods, and she wrapped two absolutely beautiful presents and laid them down in the middle of an empty living room. That's all. The girls, so the next morning, when the girls got up, fully expecting the house to be decorated, they came down stairs, and when they went into the tiny little house, they went into the living room, and all there was was two packages, two presents, one for each of them. And supposedly, the reaction 
was fabulous in terms of what the mom what the mom had experienced. The girls began sobbing. They realized their mistake. They totally got that they had been selfish, that this is what their mom had wanted, and they hadn't done it. And they immediately, before they ate breakfast that morning, and before they opened their presents, they went down to the basement, and all three of them began to set the house up and decorate it so that it would be meaningful for mom as well. The next time I saw them after Christmas, we had a really great conversation. And finally, I think when I said to the daughter about this double rules, the rules that your dad has and the rules that your mom has, she really understood. And interestingly, the thing that really got her to tears was not her dad leaving, but when I mentioned that her puppy had been taken back to the SPCA. And that was the moment in which, for her, she could really identify what selfishness really means. Now, the reason I wanted to sort of tell you that story was because, um, it's not even Christmas either. The reason I wanted to tell you that story was because it tells me a lot about that we can make our kids think we. And in fact, if if we are raising children who are sort of self-centered or selfish or this type of thing, I'm going to suggest that actually that's partly, and I don't, I don't necessarily want to blame us, but I think we have to take some responsibility for that, right? Let me give you a small, different example. How many of you have more televisions in your home than children? So the ratio is above, like more televisions than children. Just going to look out there. Anybody have more televisions than children? Some of you, nobody? Come on, put your hands up. How many people have more televisions than children? You know what I'm talking about, right? Right? Okay, there you go. Now, see, the problem with how many of you were raised in a home, though, where there were more children than televisions? Let's see. The, oh, okay. So we're very clear that the things have changed, right? Coming back to Minister, Minister Simpson's comments. Okay, so we got this down. Now, think about it this way, right? If you have inflicted this evil on your children, and actually have put more televisions than children in the home. You have denied them an opportunity to learn to think we. I mean, think about it. When you were younger and you wanted to change the channel, you had to negotiate. Okay, let's face it. You didn't negotiate. You argued, fought, tumbled, fought, you know, clawed and everything else for who was going to tr- control the television. And out of that experience, you learned about negotiation skills and all this kind of stuff. Now, think about this. If your children do not ever have to experience that, You have denied them that opportunity to learn negotiation, and you have created, my gosh, think about them as their future spouses. You are going to inflict your child on someone else's child who is going to be a spouse, and they are not going to know how to share the clicker. I mean, this is a serious problem, right? This is not just sort of idle things. We we could potentially be raising a generation of self-centered TV watchers. This 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 could be tragic. Now, in more seriousness, if I could, in, in more seriousness, I get to uh, I get this kind of have this luxury position. I get to go, to go around the world in all kinds of different places and trying to understand patterns of resilience and why kids really cope uh, exceptionally well. And this is one of the oddest things because while I experience in my clinical work back in my own practice in in, in Canada, um, though I also hear similar things happen here in Australia, you know, that kind of self-centeredness that I uh, that I see amongst that 11-year-old that I just talked about that we were able to change. What's remarkable is when I go into other countries like Cambodia, I constantly see the children who are surviving despite great odds. They actually seem to quite often be asked by their caregivers to make a genuine contribution to the welfare of their families. This is one of those weird patterns excuse me, that I see over and over again throughout the world. And the reason I'm sort of um, raising it is because it strikes me that that other families who, by necessity, have to ask their children to look after their younger siblings. So this is in Cambodia. This is by Angor Wat. You may or may not recognize the backdrop. And her parents, the girl's parents, are probably in there working at one of the jobs inside the the, the, uh, tourist site. But she obviously has responsibility for her younger sibling. And that is a phenomenon you see all over the, the, the economically developed, uh, underdeveloped world, for sure. But we, when we actually do studies on kids like this, what they say is that actually that experience of helping gives them maturity, gives them an opportunity to understand that they're making a real contribution. Now, notice I'm talking real contribution. I don't think we raise a we-thinking generation by giving them certificates for just showing up and breathing. 
You know those certificates that sometimes you get in school, that, you know, the little piece of paper, hi, you're the child of the day. You haven't done anything for anybody, but you're the child of the day. Now, there's a problem with that. What I'm really learning is that if children have a real opportunity to make a contribution, they do really that much better. Now, of course, and this is whether the child is a, a rambunctious child or a very anxious child. And even an anxious, uh, a child with a, the, the beginnings of an anxiety disorder, giving them an opportunity to not just simply come out of their room and engage, but also to have a task at hand. I've seen this work work quite magically a number of times, that when kids are actually given the opportunity incrementally, not just sort of, you know, well, you have to do this or you have to, you have to attend this event, but actually have a purpose at that event, to actually participate in the family gatherings, to, you know, to do something that somebody else is going to notice and is actually going to affect someone else's life, is going to, you know, participate in the fundraiser, is going to actually help bring, a, you know, the, the, the lady down the street has broken her hip and the, your child is going to be the one to carry down the casserole to help, you know, get some food to her or something like that. Even an anxious child will quite often respond to that real sense of genuine responsibility. Now, I mean, I can kind of walk you through, because it's really important that we sort of think about this in our, own, uh, in our own lives, too, because, you know, we want, you know, let me see if I can anchor this. I mean, are responsibilities really good for our psychosocial development? And the more genuine they are, are they even better? And does this actually help us to think we? If, you know, if this idea, you know, is, if, if this is really good, then we should be doing this for our kids. So let me, let me walk you through a few different questions, which I love to ask parents whenever they're working, whenever they have a really selfish child. These are sort of a series of questions I ask the parents. And by the way, this is, uh, this is my, my daughter a few years ago and our, and our dog. And occasionally we let our daughter sleep uh, in the kennel, or occasionally we let our daughter not sleep in the kennel because, you know, you know, child abuse and all that kind of stuff. The social workers would chase us and stuff. So, so um, the first question, okay, let me ask you, what responsibilities did you have for yourself or others when you were growing up? Like a genuine responsibility, right? Something that really, not just, you know, I had to do a tiny little task, but something that really benefited uh, your family or someone else in your community. Can I ask you just to take literally a minute and turn to somebody you, you know, and make yourself look really good by saying the incredible responsibilities that you had as a child. Okay, would you mind just taking a second and just, you know, just, just chatting to a neighbor, what was the responsibility that you had growing up? Okay, let me, let me bring you back. So obviously you're, I'm in Western Australia and you're all a very responsible group of people because there was lots of responsibilities, right? Yes, I know, you all walk, if this was Canada, I could tell you that we all walked uphill in the snow barefoot in the middle of winter, and then we walked uphill to get back home, which my kids under, never got on, caught on to until they were about six or seven years old, that you could walk uphill both ways. Um, now, let me, let me ask you, so obviously you took some responsibilities, right? That somebody realized that they needed you, that there was a genuine opportunity to contribute. And then, of course, the question is, you know, what did you learn from that particular experience? Were there things that you, life lessons that you learned, right? And that's, what, that's what's particularly poignant. I always sort of, whenever a parent is having struggling, and I'll give you some examples in a bit, is really struggling to give their child those opportunities to, to, to take responsibility, I say, well, you know, when you, were, you had those, when, what did you learn? Okay, fine. I would say, well, were those lessons um, helpful or unhelpful or both? Because sometimes we can be too burdened by responsibilities, right? Of course, that's a possibility. But generally speaking, people will say, okay, no, 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 some responsibilities I had and I, I learned something. I learned about independence. I learned about, you know, getting around the community. I learned whatever. And you do think those are helpful. Great. The kicker question, which is the last one I always ask parents then, is really quite simple. How will your own children learn these same life lessons? See, I think we sometimes lose the, the focus, right? We're so, we're so conscious about trying to make our children's lives easy, right? Okay, we've got to get them to, um, we've got, you know, we're trying to, uh, any of your kids play sports? <laughs> Multiple sports? Or piano lessons and sports? right? You know the trip. And then we're desperately trying to get everything packed up and out the door and we're trying to get to, you know, we're trying to get everything ready for the child and, and we're trying to get, 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 get the food and get the car ready and get all the gear ready and everything else. And I'm often saying to parents, well, you know, you're missing the most wonderful opportunity. 
Give your child the chance to pack their own gear. You, you're, I mean, the whole point of all these activities, is it just so the kid can kick a soccer ball for an hour? Or is it the fact that you're actually teaching them a set of generic skills about responsibility, connecting with others, healthy living, all these things. And one of the aspects of that is responsibility. They should be helping you get ready. And I know they're only seven or eight years old, maybe, but they can pack their own gear. They can take clothing out of a laundry machine. They can feed the dog. They can sort of pack. They can even help prepare lunch, if you think about it, while you're getting the car ready and do some of the tasks. That they, I don't suggest that they back the car out of the garage at seven. I mean, I think that's kind of pushing it, right? But everything else they can do. And I know the argument usually goes something like, well, if I give them all that responsibility, they're going to fail. Aren't they? Because, of course, you know and I know there's no way a seven-year-old or eight-year-old is going to get all their gear packed in the bag in the right way. And I always say, isn't failure wonderful for children? Don't you? I mean, we want our children to fail. This is one of the greatest gifts we can give children who are well-loved, right? That they have opportunities in manageable ways to fail. Because when we take responsibility and we make genuine contributions to help others in general, we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zone. Something is going to go wrong. And if we are constantly pushed a little bit, then we also learn things that we need to, to, to become more responsible. So I want my kids to fail. I want them not to pack their gear quite right. With the idea, of course, that, that by taking on that responsibility, by beginning to make that contribution to the whole family, it's not that I want them to fail, but I want them to also understand that that is something they have to follow through and they have to pay attention to. That it's not something that they can just kind of do lamely and then expect somebody else, me usually, in my family, to pick up the mess that, they, that they've made. Now, I know that might sound harsh, but, but children actually are engineered. Trust me on this. Every psychological study of this says the same thing. Children are basically engineered to want to participate, to want to help. I was building a house earlier in my life. That's my daughter about probably 16 years ago, and she's out helping us build the house or trying her best to get in the way, I think was more, more appropriate. But you know what's really interesting? When you got a child even that young, they want to think we. They want to be in there and picking things up and doing things with us. And they, 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 they I mean, don't, don't get the sense that they're going to do it philanthropically, right? They're not going to do it with the idea of, don't worry, you know, it's okay, you don't really need to say thanks, you know. They were doing it with basically, hi, I'm a toddler, look at me, I'm helping, right? And that is a perfectly normal part of, of phased development for children. Now, because it gets a little bit better as they go along, right? The first, it's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And then, of course, they get a little bit older. And what changes is it's kind of more like, I want to help, is the next piece of this, right? They kind of begin, they get a little bit older, right? And it's like anything they can do to help. That's why five-year-olds are generally not, it's not tragic for a five-year-old to have a new baby enter the family. Because usually, if you kind of engage them, they don't mind helping with the diapering and the playing and the cooing and the lifting and the carrying and everything else. They're just kind of, we're kind of engineered to take responsibility for somebody else, especially somebody smaller than us. Now, it kind of keeps going. And, you know, if you think about it, at around, you know, so that eight years old again, right, uh, it's absolutely remarkable how kids will think about the world as very sort of categorical, very much in boxes. This is the way the world should be, right? And I, I love that. that. About eight years old, I took my daughter to China because I do all this research all over the world. My children often travel with me. And uh, I remember her seeing the panda bears in Chengdu. And, and, you know, kids at that age really do get on to this environmental kick a little bit because, of course, for them, the world has some order and they want to be part of it, right? They want to be the, the enforcer of the rules. Nothing like an eight or nine, nine-year-old with a rule book, right? They love to tell everybody, I mean, recycle the garbage, Dad. My God, you just put the wrong thing in the wrong bin. I mean, they are, they are absolutely on to that stuff. In fact, let me give you an example of this. Um, a, co a colleague of mine, I was, I was, um, I was in New Zealand uh, a, f a few years ago when I was sort of generating some of these ideas, and um, he was telling me this most remarkable story of he was driving, he was just driving to work, and that, this was down in Dunedin, in our, I think it was in Dunedin or Christchurch, um, one of the big university towns in southern uh, Australia. And you know how those, uh, those Australians are, uh, sorry, those New Zealanders are absolutely, did I say Australia? Yeah, sorry, I meant New Zealand. I do know where I am. Um, 
in New Zealand, and they're, you know, they're pretty nutsy, those, some of those uh, university students, they just kind of go completely crazy. Anyways, he's telling the story of one day he's driving down the road, and it's uh, sort of early in the semester, so the students are all still pretty hyped up and everything else, and his uh, seven-year-old is in the back seat of his uh, SUV, and he's driving down the road, and in the front of him are a couple of students, a, a guy and a girl, and they're going, you know, obviously, they've got the top down on a convertible, and they're just, you know, freewheeling down the road, and they're just having a grand old time, it's a beautiful summer's day or whatever, that type of thing. Anyways, at one point, right, his you know, son's in the back seat and he's driving down the road and all of a sudden, you know, uh, the, the girl jumps up out of her seat, you know, hangs onto the windshield of the convertible, whips off her top and is just flying around, just having a grand old time, you know. Anyways, he is, he is mortified. I mean, he is just like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. I, my son my, 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 seven, my seven, eight-year-old son is in the back seat. He's going to see this. This is, this is really embarrassing, right? I, this is just inappropriate behavior and everything else. And, of course, he's trying to just, like, ignore it and maybe slow down. He's just trying to ignore it. Sure enough, kids being kids, his son points, Hey, Dad, <laughs> look at that! <laughs> and he goes, Oh, yes, yeah, 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 son, yeah. He says, and the son goes, Yeah, Dad, look, look! She's not wearing her seatbelt! And, you know, that is so true, isn't it, right? Because kids, kids kind of, you know, you give them the rules around that age, and they just love a rule book, right? Now, fortunately, they, they, they do kind of a, sort of grow out of that because they get into the tween years, the preteens and stuff like that. And it does become a little more reciprocal, right? Well, I'll do that for you if you do that for me. You know, we got order here. We got, I'll think we. Uh, sure, I'm thinking we. I'm thinking about we as far as I'm thinking about me. Right? You know, I'll do that for you, sure, but you have to drive me. You have to do me a favor, too, right? They're really good with their siblings about that kind of thing, too, right? They begin to whir figure out the games, right? And that's also part of the developmental phase. I don't think we should get down on kids at that age. Don't say, oh, come on, you should be less selfish. That is part of learning how not to be selfish. That is sort of a normal transitional phase for kids um, at that particular age. And it kind of keeps going. Um, the next phase is even kind of, is kind of a, a little bit more uh, fun. C coming back to Cambodia, uh, this is my son playing with um, uh, f spent armaments. At least I hope they were spent. There's uh, hand grenades and a variety of other things when we were in Cambodia. And he's kind of looking at one of the museums there. Um, but what was interesting about that age is you begin to think about, you know, as you kind of get into the mid-teens, you begin to think about, well, the world, I can make the world a better place, right? So we've gone from the selfish little, look at me, toddler, Right up now, you get, the, you, know, you get the sort of 13, 14 year old saying, hey, look, I can make the world a better place. And you take him to a museum like this, what was the landmine museum in Cambodia, and you know, where he met victims of landmines. I mean, kids get into that stuff. They, get really under, they begin to create that empathy for another person. They begin to see the, 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 the casualties of our actions. They begin to understand the complexities of the world. And they want to be part of those kinds of conversations. That's why um, I'm particularly impressed that around that age also you'll see like kids launching, uh, getting involved in like um, um, uh, defending uh, people who are being bullied, right? Uh, one of the big initiatives, and you know, have you heard of the pink shirt campaign? Uh, when a kid is being bullied, uh, you know, accused of being uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of heterosexist norms and, you know, some kids are teasing him about being gay or something like that. Well, that was happening in my community in just outside of Halifax. And some, some kids just went right online and they marshaled all the other kids. This one kid had worn a sort of a pinkish shirt one day to school and he was just the butt of uh, constantly being attacked by all the bullies. So the whole bunch of other kids got on Facebook and created the pink shirt movement, essentially. They, they went down to a, a cheap, uh, sort of a, 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 a really cheap store, and they bought for a dollar a piece pink shirts. And they began to distribute them all to the other students in the school as a way of sort of basically talking back to the bullies and said, we can unite and we can actually together, you know, confront you. And that's what's really interesting about it. I know sometimes we're really down on technology, eh? How many people, I mean, there's this constant this kind of worry that, oh, the technology is ruining our kids. But you know what? I hate to tell you, but there's a lot of good in that technology. You think about it. Our kids can organize, well, they can organize a house party too, but they can organize, they can organize themselves into a movement if they want really, really quickly. They can, they can crowdsource 
for people. And their sense of, of cultural, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the kind of the multiplex of cultures in our world is far in excess of what I had growing up, right? They just listen to what's on your kid's iPod someday, ignoring the dirty words, and just listen to what's there in terms of cultures colliding in the musics that they're, that, that, that they're listening to. I mean, the world for them is definitely shrinking, and I'm going to argue perhaps becoming a little bit better place. I think our kids are less sexist. I think our kids are far less um, 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 uh, homophobic. I think our kids are far less racist than we were. So I know that we're sometimes worried about them, but we're always not, not necessarily also looking for some of the benefits either. Finally, I'm going to argue that if you've done it right, and even if you haven't done it right, eventually kids will kind of get the message that they do want this kind of give and take world back to that you know, sharing the remote, because eventually they all move on to spouses and they decide that I'm going to, even if my parents haven't taught me this, I'm still going to learn how to share the remote with my spouse. Kids eventually just really want to be, you know, in relationships. They want to have an intimacy and they want to, through that intimacy, often they learn sort of this, this give and take back and forth. Now, what, what I'm actually finding then through all this is that, um, Broadly speaking, we can then teach kids how to take responsibility. And we seem, to, we seem to do it in a number of ways. So developmentally, our children want us to help them find responsibility. It's a normal phase. We're doing our job when we give them that, for sure. Now, there's a few things that we can sort of focus on that might, I'm going to give you these nine things in once. There's at least nine different things that I keep seeing that sort of really seem to help kids develop well, and a lot of them sort of help kids to think in more we terms. The first two, and all, and all nine of these sort of go together in a package. In fact, they're the things that kids seem to need to grow up well. Now, for instance, structure and consequences, appropriate consequences. They're really important. They seem to merge together, don't they? Right? And if you think about it, if we can give kids those opportunities to, to, to begin to think about their, their sense of contribution to others, then, then, then we can help them understand, uh, understand how, how, how they're placed in the world. Often we don't get the consequence right, and therefore we miss the opportunity to teach kids what they need. I'll give you a small example. Um, when my son was about uh, 10 years old, um, he very much uh, didn't want to um, uh, set the table. And we went through this kind of long, you know, you know, fighting it out. Do you ever do this with your own kids? You're fighting it out, you're fighting it out. You know, come on, kids. So I was home one night, and I was cooking the dinner and stuff, and I was trying to get him to set the table, and he wouldn't set the table, and I kept getting more and more frustrated. It's like, come on, Scott, you know, set the table. You know, you're 10 years old, you can help. I just got home from work. I'm earning, you know, I'm supporting the family too. I get in here and set the table. It's the smallest contribution you can make to dinner, right? I'm going to cook dinner and everything else. He, was, he still dawdled away and made up some excuse and everything else. Eventually I said, enough. We are a family. And if you're a part of this family, then this is an expectation that you make a contribution. And if you're not going to do that, then darn well, go cook your own dinner. I'm tired of this, right? This is ridiculous, right? And see, the consequence, I didn't take away his cell phone. I don't think he had a cell phone at that point. I didn't banish him to his room. I didn't take away something else. I just simply said to him, what's a natural consequence to the structure? My message was, you're part of a family. You don't want to participate in the family, then I'm not going to participate with you. I'm not going to drive you if I'm too busy cleaning up dishes, and I'm not going to drive you to wherever you're going to need to go after supper, and I'm certainly not going to cook you your dinner. And he did, in that moment, what every good 10-year-old would say back to his parents. He said, fine, I'll cook my own dinner. <laughs> to which I said, no problem. You don't want to participate in this family? No problem. I'm not supervising you on the stove, though. So you can eat anything you want. No crap, no garbage food, you know. You can eat anything decent as long as it doesn't involve the stove, okay? Go for it, kid. And the kid, he knew how to do this stuff. So sure enough, we all sit down for dinner. I set the table, got my other kid in, got everything set up, whatever. And he went and basically made himself a sandwich of sliced meats or some peanut butter and jam, whatever it was. And he sort of proudly trucks out to the table, you know, proud. Sits down, looks around, keeps eating. It's like, I got one up on you, kid. Yeah, yeah, real proud. No problem. You don't want to participate. You don't participate. Well, I'm not going to buy into this, right? So the next morning, before he goes off to school, I, was putting, you know, I said to him, Scott, I'm just curious. Tonight, are you part of this family or are you not? Are you going to set the table or are you not? And he again did what every good 10-year-old would do in a situation like that. He simply said, I'll make my own dinner. I said, fine. Makes it easier on me. So he goes off to school. And on the way to, um, on the, on the way to uh, my office, I go buy the uh, grocery store because I need to buy some food for dinner. And I buy all the ingredients for his favorite dinner. <laughs> 
I buy all the ingredients for a big stacked meat lasagna. I buy the garlic bread at the store rather than making it myself. I prefer the homemade stuff. He prefers the stuff from the store. All the stuff like that, right? And basically, he comes home. I made sure I got home before him too that night so that the house was wafting wafting with the sense of garlic and meat sauce and everything else. And he comes into the house and it's like, oh, this isn't quite what I expected. Yeah. So anyways, so we all sit down for dinner eating whatever. And he is, of course, eating a sandwich made of peanut butter and jam or something, right? So, okay, good. Next morning, third day, I just, he just wakes up. I said, Scott, I'm just curious. I've got to you know, get dinner prepped for tonight. Are you setting the table or are you going to join into the family? And he grudgingly said, I'll set the table. You know, it's interesting. When you get the structure, kids want structure. Never estimate that. Never underestimate that. Kids want to know that they're loved because they're, they're, they have some structure around them. But they also want consequences that hold them accountable to us. We create we thinking kids by holding them accountable in ways. And we get it wrong so often. You know, the kid who throws the uh, graffitis, this businessman's, uh, the businesswoman's uh, a business over here, and then we send the kid over to the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, to do community service hours. Kid doesn't get it. Forget it. There's no, there's no learning in that. There's no connection between the two things, right? We don't, until kids actually, they have to feel like they actually belong in communities. They've got to be held accountable for what they've done. That's what teaches us to, to have empathy for others, and, to, and, and it starts with us. We can structure those things much closer. The, you know, and parent-child relationships are so critical for teaching kids to think we. You know, it's so important that kids have that connection with us as adults, but I've got to tell you, it's not enough. That myth that we are the only people important to our kids is actually kind of a fallacy, especially as they get older. Because the fourth thing that they need, of course, is lots and lots of other nurturing relationships. They need to feel that they are part of extended families. They need to feel like they have a contribution to make to somebody else's welfare, too. In fact, I often say to families, you know, if you're totally fed up with your selfish little brat, sorry, your child, and you want to, you know, help them to grow a little bit, Send them away for it. Go share the joy with one of your extended family. <laughs> you know that older brother or sister who tormented you for many years? This is the time to share the love. You know, take your child, put them on an airplane. They're, you know, assuming they're 12, assuming you can afford it, right? And ship them across the country. Ship them to Sydney. Get them over to that relative of yours and let them, you know, help them. Let them be part of their lives for a little while. And the interesting thing is that sometimes those extended family members can bring out the best in our kids. Isn't that true? It's like, it's like they, they all of a sudden have to sort of be on their best behavior. They know that now it's like, oh, jeepers, I have to actually get them to actually like me. I have to actually participate in this family. I have to maybe set the table for them, right? I've got to do something. And there is something to be said for us getting other people involved with our kids. I love it, especially when there's a meaningful opportunity. Have them go and help the neighbor who's broken her hip. Have them get involved in the fundraising activities for breast cancer and other, you know, diseases. You know, they are watching us do those things, but they also need to be invited in to those social and political and, and, and sort of all those kinds of activities in our communities. You want your kids talking to strangers, right? You want them engaging with other people and learning the social skills so that they can be a part of their communities. I guess from that, you often see kids developing a really powerful identity, right? They want to be known in their community as the kid who brought over the casserole to Mrs. Smith after she fell down and broke her hip. So they want, in my country, to be known as the kid who shoveled the walkway for Mrs. Smith because she broke her hip, right? They want to participate. They want to, you know, they want to be involved with us when we, when we, I don't know, if we have a boat, are we, are we getting them to help us fix it up? Or are, if we have a special project, are they involved in those, right? Are they helping us cook the, the special meal for grandpa on his birthday? All those activities, whether they're five years old or 15 years old, kids are waiting for us to give them an invitation to participate. They also want, through those experiences, a sense of control. They want to know that not only do they have a powerful identity in their community, but they want experiences where they can feel like they have some kind of control of their world. And it's really important because with that control also comes a sense that, hey, you know, I can belong. I do belong here. In fact, that's what worries me a little bit, that we've created the selfish generation. I, I know it sounds a bit odd, but if we don't ever give our kids a sense of control, we don't ever ask of them opportunities to make those contributions to their families. And 
do things under their own steam, under their own power, I think we deny them this, this opportunity to, to think we. Like, for, and I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but we've, we're the ones, we're actually probably the most selfish, I'm thinking myself, right? In my generation, we're actually the most selfish generation, not our kids. I mean, think about it honestly. Be honest with yourselves. Isn't our generation the selfish one? Didn't we build suburbs and, you know, and make it so impossible for kids to sort of, you know, like everything is a drive? Kids can't just kind of get on their bicycles, go down to the, the store. How many of you were asked by your parents to, you know, get on your bicycle, go down to the store, and pick up a pack of cigarettes? I mean, don't you want your kids? <laughs> okay, we don't want our kids doing that. But we might want our kids to go down to the store and pick up a jug of milk. And, of course, they can't even do that in many of the way we design our suburbs, right? We've, we're the ones who have isolated ourselves in our private homes, which wasn't the case maybe two generations ago. You know, we're the ones that are sort of, um, you know, we're the ones who have designed this world where there's not a lot of opportunities necessarily to think socially, or maybe not enough opportunities to think socially. So before we beat up the kids, make sure that we get our, our own act together, I guess is what I'm understanding. Um, let me give you a, 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 a sort of another sort of small little example of this. Um, I love, you know, you could do this in so many different ways. One of the, I, I saw a school, in, in my community there's a school that works with kids who are, are really vulnerable readers. And the reason I'm raising these kids, because often we don't think of kids as competent, right? So, you know, the, you have a kid who's seven or eight years old and they can't read very well, right? And they're really awkward and they're shy and they're anxious and they're, they're just one of those socially awkward kids and everything else. And they, maybe their reading skills aren't great and they're not academically inclined and stuff. Well, how do you ever get a kid like that to participate and make a meaningful contribution at home? Well, they could help cook, maybe. But what about at school? How does school use a kid like that in a meaningful way? Well, there's lots of ways. One of the programs that um, they use in my, in my community is called PAWS, P-A-W-S. And what they do is there's this guy in town that has this humongous, humongous St. Bernard dog. Weighs about almost 200 pounds. Um, and the dog, the guy brings his dog in. The dog still thinks it's a lap dog, by the way. It likes to climb. It, seriously, he sits in the park with it, and it kind of sits on his lap. Can you imagine? Really. So this is one of these absolutely gentle creatures. And what the school allows them to do is they bring in Rufus, the dog. And Rufus is a bit old, so Rufus sleeps a lot. And they bring Rufus in, and they put Rufus into a small little room on the side of the school. And they ask basically this. They go to the kids that are particularly vulnerable readers. And they say to the kids, look, you know, you know George has brought in Rufus today. And we're curious, could you come and help us a little bit? Rufus is really bored because George had to leave. Could you go into the room with Rufus and read aloud to him? Because Rufus just is, you know, kind of bored and stuff. And if you actually, I know this is, sounds crazy, but actually kids will do it. They will go in with their books, and these are, of course, the vulnerable readers, the ones who will never utter a word in class because they're too shy. They will tarry their book, they will go into the classroom, and inevitably, if you peek, your, if you peek in about 10 minutes later, Rufus is, of course, like down on the ground like this with his legs out, right? And the kids will snuggle in between the legs and be reading to Rufus. You know, they will actually do it, and they'll be reading out loud. In part because, of course, I, and I checked this out, by the way, in two years that this guy's been doing this, right, not once has Rufus corrected a child who mispronounced the word. <laughs> now, the point being is that if you can convince a child that they have a role, that they can actually do something to help someone else, it's absolutely magical. In fact, how many of you have pets or dogs in specifically? You don't really walk your cat. So, and who walks the dog out for the poop and scoop? Come on. The kid, yeah. You are the kids. Now, how many of you bought the darn dog specifically for the child? Right? And did you, the kids said pr they promised, they promised, they promised, and then within about two weeks, right, they're not walking the dog. And I, and I see this kind of pattern over and over again of us acquiescing, of us sort of too quickly giving in without necessarily giving our children these opportunities to demonstrate responsibility. I got to tell you, that dog that you saw my daughter cuddle up with, even at, you know, nine years old, eight years old, she was out there most mornings walking that dog, taking her turn, poop, you know, picking up the poop, making sure that that was part of her duty if it was going to be her pet. Maybe that makes me a mean parent, I don't know. But, the, but you know, it, there is that sort of need for us to invite and responsibility and to hold our children um, accountable to, to what we expect uh, them to do. You know, the, other, the number seven here is about a sense of belonging. And a sense of belonging or spirituality, a sense that you, your life has some bigger meaning, that is not something that just magically happens in kids' lives. It's something that we give them. 
It's something that we, that we can kind of instill in them, sometimes through our religious affiliation, but more often just by just simply um, giving them opportunities to belong at school, to help. My, my son, when he was um, a DJ, I used to love to watch him work with some of the more vulnerable kids, some of the anxious kids in the school. And he'd invite them to help him do the DJing, not really to play the tunes, because they they, that would maybe be a bit overwhelming for some. But what he loved to do was get them involved in lugging those big speakers around. You know, There's something really powerful about the kid. No matter how awkward you are, you can lug a big speaker. And it's the kid... And you, you, the, the guy who's doing the tech up here probably remembers this as a child, right? Didn't you always want to be the, the guy who, you know, plugs that, 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 that speaker cord in and makes that lovely, you know, pop sound, right? That's the person, right? That person has power. But they also are making a contribution, something that their community, their school, their peers have allowed them to make. Um, the, the next thing we want, are, I think, that helps us to sort of think we, of course, is when we get fair and just treatment. Let's face it, if, you know, we want, we want to, to reach out, we want to be treated fairly by others, and, and that kind of, again, teaches us the empathy. If we're treated fairly, if we're not racially you know, marginalized, if we're not teased because of how we look or in any way, then generally speaking, we also develop empathy for others. That's sort of the, 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 the very much the cycle of it, isn't it? Um, there's also here the, the basic need for psychological and social safety, just basically that we need to feel safe in our world. I saw this, you know, people want to join in. Even the most delinquent and troubled kids, I'll say this honestly, they want to feel a part of something. And if we don't open our doors, they find gangs. They find street involved, other street-involved youth. They will do whatever they need to do to find that sense of belonging, protection, control, power, because fundamentally we are engineered to link to others. I'll give you an example. There's a high school in the United States in Baltimore that takes all the kids that are rejected, expelled, from all the other high schools in Baltimore. And when I, I was over there for a day and visiting the school and talking to the principal, a guy named Jason Hartling, and what we actually were talking about was the fact that he was actually very proud. He kind of had this little badge of honor when he took over the school two years before I met him. At that school, there were literally, there was a couple badges of honor. One was that in one year, they had 400 and more than 450 critical incidents in one school year. Now, I'm talking like, like rapes, violent offenses with guns, knifing, you know, people being stabbed, police being called, drug busts, those kinds of things. Okay, that's what we're talking about here in this school, right? Now, what was interesting was, when the other thing that Jason said was, the other badge of honor we have is that every single child, all 1,200 that we have in our school right now, all of them failed the, uh, the national exam, the state exams. So, you know, the PISA scores, all of them failed those exams. So that's where he was starting from. What he did was to calm the violence in the school and to give kids all these things into their world, he did a bunch of things. He actually insisted that his teachers go home with the students. He insisted that his teachers fully understand where they were sending their kids. When they gave a homework assignment, that the teacher understood where the child was going at night what kind of house the child was returning to, what kind of safety, what kind of kitchen, where the child was actually doing their homework. The teachers had to participate in that kind of activity to engage with the students. And what it signaled to the students was that these people care about you, that they are going to finally be the kinds of people who actually care about you. And in that modeling of that we thinking, the kids began to get it. He also did other things like in the school itself to comment, he brought the community into the school. He had hall monitors that were the same ethnic and racial background as the kids themselves. So when a kid got up from his classroom and wanted to go to the toilet or something, right, he actually was, met, each child was met at the door to their classroom and they were walked to the toilet by somebody who could essentially connect with them, talk like them, look like them, right? And the neat thing about those connections was these people weren't just, you know, enforcers of rules. They were people who got to know the kids by name. They made the kids feel like they were in a community. Every child also who wanted to participate in an extracurricular activity, there was a space for them. He opened like six basketball teams instead of just the elite one, which often happens in high schools, right? Especially in uh, more Afri uh, African-American uh, dominated schools, right? You have the very best players and everyone else can't play at all. That was in Jason's idea. His idea was everyone can participate. And the best of all, he made the school safe by taking away the, 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 all the metal detectors and the police officers. 
No, I said that again. He took away the metal detectors and the police officers because, let's face it, if you, if you make your buildings look like prisons, people act like prisoners. Basic, basic psychology 101. And what he did instead was, he, now of course he, had to, he wasn't a fool, right? He knew that he had to calm the violence. He knew he had to protect his students and keep everyone safe still. So he left the still doors on the school so they couldn't be smashed in and stuff. And yes, he had a roster sheet of the kids who had been you know, misbehaved one day and couldn't come back till the next day and all that kind of stuff. But he put a, a he, he actually staffed his, um, his uh, front desk, his, his front meeting area with the ultimate security team absolutely impenetrable security team. It wasn't a police officer, and it wasn't a private security guard. It was two grandmothers. <laughs> now, come on, you gotta admit, you have to be one mean little effer to take on a granny, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you don't do that. That ain't cool, right? You don't swear to granny, you don't take her down, you don't punch a granny, you don't sort of do what your granny doesn't tell you to do. You listen to grandmothers, right? And so very much the grannies would be there and the kid would come through the door and they'd check down the list. Oh, no, no, Johnny, you're not supposed to be here today. But honey, honey, you come back tomorrow. Hey, how's your mom doing? Yeah, okay, you say hi for me, okay? Okay, yeah, no, you can't come in today because of what happened. Yeah, you come back tomorrow, okay? You come back. And that kind of sense of belonging and place calmed the school dramatically. He didn't fix all the problems. But boy, they went from 450 critical incidents to just over 100. Now, that still is an outrageous amount, but that was a lot better than where they were at before. So what I'm beginning to learn is that, you know, that we can actually shape kids. We can give them opportunities to think we like this. We can actually help them to, 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 um, to do things, to, to think more sort of their, about their social responsibilities. And in a way, I'm going to challenge you in here in a second. That, that, I mean, didn't we also have opportunities in some of us? You, you'd mentioned before that you had some responsibilities. But let me run you through here. Let's imagine if I could in this room. Let's just watch. Just think about because so, you, you have kids at all kinds of different ages. I take it you have different age kids, right, in the room, right? So let me, let me sort of think about this for a second. Let's imagine that I put up, I, I had just put up some signs here, if I could have around the room. And I'll start way over there, say age five, six, age 7, age 8, age 9, maybe age 10, 11, and 12, so 12 is about here, and then 13, and age 14, and age 15, and age 16, 17, 18, 18 is over there, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23, okay? So from age 5 all the way to age 23 with sort of about, you know, maybe about here is age 12. Now let me ask you this. Just point with your hand to so your neighbor. When did you first have control over, say, your own money. Now, maybe some of you don't yet have that control with your spouse, but, so you can point way back there. But assuming that some of you, when did you finally have some money that you can control, which is part of this growing up and taking responsibilities, right? Just point. Where did you point? When did you finally have some responsibility for control? <laughs> some of you are pointing over there. <laughs> Interesting, but a lot of you are pointing somewhere kind of down here or over here, right? So again, you know, you think if you have children, are they going to have control of their own money? Are they going to have some, not all their own money, but some of their own money? Are you going to teach them that responsibility? And with that responsibility, they're also going to have responsibility to spend their money on other people. Next time there's a birthday party, give them a, if you were giving your child a $5 a week allowance, does that money also then have to go not just to pop and chips, but does it also have to go to buying birthday presents for their friends when they go to a birthday party? Think about how we can do that. I mean, I could ask you the same, one, same question. Um, when, when, did you, when was the first time that you fought for a cause? When you really stood up for some, you know, you really sort of stood up for a cause that was social, that, that benefited not just yourself, but somebody else. Again, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way to 12, all the way into your early 20s. What age did you fight for a cause the first time? First time you remember really standing up and fighting for a cause. Interesting, eh? We have those experiences. And what about the last question, third question? When was the, when, what, what age did you actually have to Look after someone else, where their care really was in your hands, where they, really you had to do something. You were babysitting them, or you were looking after an elderly person, but you really had responsibility for another person. They were really in your care. What age? 
Now, what's interesting about that is that some of you are pointing more and more over here, which is really quite exceptional, isn't it? Which also, and a lot of you are pointing in around here, which says that if you are raising children, and, you know, you have not already got them cooking for others and participating in your family and looking after community members and all that kind of stuff, you could, you could be running out of time. And I'm not, I'm not just joking about that. I'm really serious. That if we don't do it now, if we're not sort of giving our kids these opportunities, then by the time they come around there, it's too late, right? They're going to be launched from us, and they're not going to, they are going to be that selfish bunch of citizens who aren't going to vote, who aren't going to participate, and aren't going to be part of the solution. And that's going to be on our shoulders. We can't blame the kids. We just can't keep blaming the kids on this. We've got to think about it more as well from our perspective of what, of what in a sense, we're offering our kids. So, whew, on that note, it's really up to us, isn't it? But there's so much that we can do, and that's kind of what I was really trying to suggest, right? We can get our kids. The one thing, the one biggest message I do know is that our kids are watching us. When we walk for breast cancer, when we, you know, bake that casserole, when we make that cake for grandpa, when we, um, you know, whatever we are doing, our kids are watching us. When we sort our trash, <laughs> I think our kids are teaching us, not just watching us. When we do whatever it is, our kids are watching us. And the better we are at showing, showing that empathy and that kindness to others, right, the better this next generation will be. But the good news is that they're tracking there anyways. They are engineered to want uh, those experiences, and very much they are hopeful that they're, they, the people in their lives will actually teach them that. Whew. So on that note, why don't I simply uh, pause there and just sort of say, you know, the, the other thing about this, of course, is there is a slight issue that I need to raise, too, which is finally, I just want to show you one last little slide here before I, before I open it up for questions. That's my daughter in the Amazon jungle. We were down in an eco-lodge. Uh, I had to do some work down around there as well. And my daughter is actually talking to a little girl who's about her same age uh, in a village nearby. And they were, my kids were all playing soccer that day with, with them and, and stuff like that. And it's just, they got trounced, by the way. The Brazilians are going to rock at, uh, at, the, um, at the, the World Cup. Um, but what's interesting is you see the reality. That, I mean, wh how we teach our kids to think we. I mean, in a community like this, these kids are very much immersed in a community that's much more collective, much more collectivist than my daughter's. There is differences. What that we thinking, what a child needs to think we is going to change depending on their culture and their context. But irregardless of your culture and regardless of your context, if you just think back to what you were doing as a child, chances are you'll be guided in terms of how to help your own child as well. So on that note, let me say thank you very much for listening. And I wish you all the best with your own children. And hopefully, hopefully you raise that next we generation as well. All the best. Now, I understand we have some time for, uh, for, for questions, and uh, I think we can bring the house lights up a little bit. They said they would. And um, I think there are some people with microphones floating around, and I can actually, if you need this extra microphone that I'm holding, I can also bring that down to the audience as well. There's some ushers that have uh, um, some microphones. People have any questions that I didn't get to this evening, something that you'd really like to, to, uh, to put out. I'm really happy to sort of drift in. So just down here, hi, good evening. Hi, thanks. Do you have any advice for parents of only children that might be a bit more common now than it was 30 years ago? Fewer dynamics in the house, fewer yelling, uh, yelling and screaming matches points of negotiation. That, that's such a good point. Eh? If you have an only child, there's just a lot of this we thinking challenges isn't, isn't there. But I do see a lot of families, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're doing this, a lot of families compensating for that by creating uh, mixed peer groups, uh, getting their children into more activities. So in some ways, we're having to create communities um, around our kids. I, I will say that uh, the one thing I do really like though, and one thing that I think sometimes we forget to do, if I, if I could make one minor suggestion beyond the obvious of get your kid out there into social activities, is put your kid into activities where there's multiple ages of children. And we don't do that very much, eh? Our tendency is to set up a play date with kids that are exactly the same age. But actually, in terms of teaching we thinking, 
it's, that's why siblings are good, is because it's the different ages. So if you have cousins and you know, extended family, that's a great source of, uh, of someone to inflict your child upon. But if you don't have that, then you know, just thinking about activities in your community where the child will feel some responsibility for a younger child, and even better, be doting on an older child. My gosh, my son, when he was five years old, the best thing I could do to control him was put him in the shadow of a nine-year-old boy. And he was just like... You know, anything that boy told him to do. But, I mean, in that was also that sense of you have to be good to get his attention, right? There's a reciprocity in those relationships, right? He, my son wanted to be in his shadow. And it's, it's those kinds of things that I think, you know, we, we tend to, I think we're a bit cautious about that. We don't trust our children to be sometimes with younger kids, and when they're older, we don't trust them to be in the shadows of older kids. That is, that is not the natural way. We were actually, again, designed to mentor and to be mentored. And those are really, I think, sort of the more formative developmental things. I'm not sure if that helps a bit. Hi, over, over here, I think, sir. Thanks, buddy. Hi, um, First, thanks very much for speaking and, and coming all this way. Um, school years, really formative, really influential. Some might say more than any other time in your life. My child or children are going to see their school teachers more than they will me for many, many years. But an education system that is built around several contradictions to what you're talking about tonight, what advice do you have? And keeping in mind departments don't talk to each other. <laughs> so an education system which is um, way behind on these sorts of thinking. What do you see in specifically that doesn't happen to get kids to think we in our school system? Like, is there something that very specifically you're imagining or you're, you're um, imagining? Yeah, just earlier on you were talking about you know, certificates for everybody. I guess a celebration of mediocrity. Um, also, um, the anxiety, you know, not bringing kids who may have anxieties into um, bringing them out of their shell or making them sort of join in even if it's only in part of a conversation. We've just had programs, in, they're youngsters mind you, but we've just had programs where there was new, uh, weekly uh, news in a very fun way, just an item of, of clothing or a favourite toy and you talk about it. We just had that cancelled because it caused anxiety to a couple of kids in the class. And I've got empathy for those kids or those parents or what have you, but why as a school would you cancel that program and not work around the issues? I don't get it. So. They cancelled it. Cancelled yeah. it. See, that's the kind of stuff I must admit that then teaches our kids that, that you know, um, that's not teaching empathy for the other. Wouldn't the solution have been to use that as a teachable moment from both sides? For the children who are comfortable to understand how to make a comfortable space for the child that isn't, and for the child that isn't, to simply find a way of participating in that that, that was more meeting their needs. I mean, did they really have to get up and speak? Could they not have done a YouTube That's video? My point, my <laughs> you point. know, like, yeah. could, they, could they not have put their toy or their show and tell written a story and put it on the desk? Could they not have, could we not can we not accommodate, teach our children how to accommodate uh, differences while at the same time coaching everyone else about respect? So, so see, here's my problem with that, is that, and I'm sure you have exactly the same thing. So if those kids never have to learn to accommodate and how to be kind to someone who's shy, who's going to teach them that stuff? What do you speak? You think they just magically learn it? Like, they're not, you know, they're, they're going to end, you know, like, they're going to look like John Belushi in Animal House by the time but they the get into, you know. The big one is um, dietary requirements as well. Sorry? Di dietary requirements. It's super important for kids with those um, sorts of issues, but if you're not teaching that responsibility at a young age in a, in a group environment which is relatively safe in a school with responsible okay. people, when are they, it's more unsafe for them to not be taught those issues than to um, you know, have a peanut butter sandwich at, at, at playtime. I see, yes. It's, it's, it's this kind of, we're not necessarily creating safe environments by, by sort of sanitizing them to the point that children don't. We want children to be stressed. We want a little bit. I mean, you know, the anxiety. I don't, I don't mean the child with the anxiety disorder has to stand up in front. But surely we can teach children how to accommodate differences and find creative solutions to participation so that every child feels like they have a space. That child with the anxiety disorder may be able to do something much more creative as their show and tell. I mean, I don't know, five-year-olds seem to be able to use their computers to create little videos that they load up on YouTube or something like that. You know, you know whatever. You could, it's absolutely remarkable. I would go more in that direction than constantly trying to um, signal to everyone else that you, know, you don't have to participate, that everyone, every, your world is, you don't ever have to try in the world. I, I just don't, I don't think that's getting us the kind of citizens we want at the end of the, the day. So it's a good point. Thank you for that.
Oh, there. Hi. Back. Yes, we're back. Or did I miss anybody else? Yeah. Back there? Great. Hi, folks. Oh, yeah. I'm listening. You guys up there. You're in the cheap seats up there, but uh, we, can, we, can, we can run a mic up there if you, if you wave. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, I feel so fortunate to attend this session. Yeah, more than like question, I have one sharing. Uh, myself, I come from a very tiny village, far off oh, from the road and from the city. But we, we feel like differently, like more than here, like my, the, the society I experience here in Australia is like people are more like, parents are more possessive to their children. And they are like, uh, more than children, it, I have seen it, it has been started from the parents themselves because they are much worried about their own children. But compared to it, the, when I go back to my childhood, my parents those days, oh, I, I lost both of them, but used to say more than worrying about your children, why not to worry about other children? Like our, my parents always used to say, let our children mirror yeah. us Rather, our worry has to be there to the society. Mm. When the society, children in the society are better, then we are happier and we are peaceful. That's One thing, and that, that's, that's the different way of, you know, see, looking at it. Like, uh, it, it, I couldn't agree more that, in fact, uh, sometimes people in very small communities actually have that advantage over in the cities. Uh, Those many cities compensate. I, think, I know lots of people in cities who are trying to give their kids you know, that sense of connection is, but you're right about that. Um, we'd have, we're, is that the same here in Australia, that people are very shy to criticize or to parent other people's children? Is that, is that almost like, you know, if I'm in a playground and I see, you know, the other child doing something really dangerous or something, or happen to say something, I'll be chewed up by the parent rather than anybody saying, go, hey, you should have listened to that man or something. You know, you kind of get that. I even had, I'll give you a wild story. I gave, I had, I had a principal tell me a story just recently in which he was, he was driving home this is in Canada, and he was driving home, and kids, you know how kids will play, you may have seen this, hockey on the streets with nets? So they'll block the, a side street, a little tiny, this is common in Canada, it's not a big deal, and you sort of toot your horn, you know, and the kids will pull the nets aside, and then you drive on. And as he's driving on, there's some kids from his school, and one of them is about, like, you know, it's just nine years old or something, and as he's driving by, the, the, the nine-year-old calls out something, some derogatory remarks, and gives him the, you know, the finger, right? Well, he's the, he slams on his brakes, backs the car up and says to the kid, hey, come on, I was polite, I just honked, you know, I waited, I said, come on, there was no call for that, that was really rude, and he knew the kid's name, and he called him by name, and said, tomorrow when, you're back, when, we, when you come to school, I want to see you in my office, that was just out of line, so he drives on, next day, the kid comes into the office, the, the principal, you know, explains a little bit again how that wasn't on, and that wasn't a call for behavior, and it doesn't, just, you know, made him feel very Strange. Anyways, he said, look, I want you after school, just a, a little short detention for 15 minutes. You come on back in. I want you to just kind of help me with the, the cleaning the brushes or whatever, clean, doing, doing something up at the board or whatever he had the kid do or whatever. Could you, could you do that? Are you gonna, I'm going to have you do that, okay? Because that was not nice that you did. So far, so good? The parent calls the teacher, the principal, shortly thereafter, and says basically, how dare you give my kid a detention? My son was, I don't care what he said to you, my son was off of school property, and if you persist in this, I will have my lawyer call you. This was, I'm not making this up, this is actually, and they were like livid that this principal was trying to correct their, her son. Now, that kind of stuff will happen. And, and he, you know, he basically backed down, he had to back down, right? He, I mean, how much, you know, whatever. But the evilness of that to that child Right? In terms of raising a, a very self-centered and selfish child. And are you seeing anything like this? Where the, the tendency is that we cannot take, we are not asking our children to take responsibility for their actions. You know, we are not sort of holding them accountable all the time in ways that they can act. And again, I'm emphasizing, this isn't about punishment. This isn't about locking them away more. Nothing, you know, this is about giving them opportunities to make amends for their actions. Helping them to actually correct it. Other questions? Yeah, Something back this, there. That was my sharing, and my question is this. <laughs> I have a question. Question is, uh, don't you think like the research institute like yours and professionals like who are dedicated in this kind of activity, don't you think there is a strong need of developing some kind of course in universities or research centers like 
engineering more than like civil engineering or mechanical engineering, more like like children engineering or youth engineering kind of. <laughs> I think you answered your own question. <laughs> Child engineering 101. It's true. We, we 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 don't need a license to have a child, do we? Um, someone, where, back? Uh, I see. I see here a question. Okay, and then we can go back there, please, sir. Yeah, Michael. Um, I my wife and I live in a. We've got two boys. We live in a three-bedroom house. One of those bedrooms is my office. So my two boys have learnt to share a bedroom. Uh, you we, evil parent, you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure people walk into my house and sort of look around and think, "Where's the rest of it?" There's. You know, we have one sort of shared communal area, so, you know, if someone's watching TV, they have to be a bit quiet for if I'm in my office. Do you find today people, if they've got five kids, they think they need a five-bedroom house and they all need to have a bathroom? So, you know, you've got a two-year-old in one room, a three-year-old in another. We give them this sense of entitlement at such an early age, and, we, and we're not really teaching them that, you know, maybe if we built, you know, smaller houses with a bigger backyard for the kids to play in, we seem to think we've got a 500 square meter house, we need to put 450 meters of house on it. Every kid has to have a bedroom and then we give them nowhere to play because the back garden turns into a Japanese garden or something that you can't really throw a ball in. And we build these trophy houses and we, and we don't make homes, we build houses yeah. and we set our kids up to fail right from the start. It does, it does worry me. Again, it's how we design. I mean, this is coming back to my point about maybe we're the more selfish generation. We, we create these spaces which, of course, are quiet and calm and everyone has their own space in the room. But um, you, you, we really, I don't know if it definitely meets the needs of kids to feel connected to their parents. I mean, if you can come in and not hear your kids in the house, that's a problem. I mean, you know, that, that's, not, that's not what the kids need. In fact, to tell, in the book, um, uh, We Generation, that, that is available here, uh, but I actually tell the story, and it's a true story of a, of, a, of, a, of a kid that basically committed suicide. And he basically said, you know, I just want to be, if, if he has something, I figure exactly how it goes now, but it was something along the lines of, if someone, next person comes in the house, no one calls me, no one reaches out to me, no one notices I'm in this house, I'm just going to kill myself. And the kid did. Because it was like, it was like one of those things of just how empty that you don't even know your you know how empty that is we have i have a lot of families who don't even eat with their kids anymore they oh well you know he and so likes eating those things and we like eating these things and there's the television and i mean if you're not eating with your kid and this is across all cultures pretty much if you're not eating with your children about three times a week which again puts you in proximity to them right um you're probably not defending them against a lot of the other evils that could overtake them in life. It's one of the most highest predictors of resilience, future in life, to eat with your children, to engage with them. I mean, there is something about, I, I know what you mean by that small house. There is something kind of magical about that, and you bump into your kids more. So if you do have a large trophy house, you call it, maybe you've got to start cleaving off a few rooms, rent them out to some homeless people or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> You know, um, you know, but but there is a need a little bit to to create a more. Uh, there is something very magical uh, about making sure that at least, however you, it doesn't matter where you live. The ultimate difference is how do you create that structure so that you're engaging with your child, um, you know, in ways that are actually meaningful. Did I have a question back there? And then I see one a hand down here. Yeah, um, mine is just some advice about negotiating going into the sort of teen years and you're trying to get your child to make the right choices and be responsible and yeah. basically they want to belong and their peers are having more influence but how they're trying to belong is to a group of kids that the cool kids are basically not that cool making the wrong choices and not so bright and how you sort of you can see it unfolding <laughs> but you, I, we don't really know what to do because our son wants to sort of fit in but He's smart and he's social, but the kids that he wants to belong to aren't, aren't really a part of that. So there's going to be that sort of, the, he's betwixt in between. How do you negotiate that? So if I could, every time I meet a child like that, and it may not be your son's exact taste, but the question I always ask is, he has all these different people he could associate with. So I always ask the kids, tell me what you like about those youth. Not what the problem with those kids is. Because... Peer, there's no, I, I did some research on this a while back about peer pressure, and actually I couldn't find it. Peer pressure doesn't exist. It's always something we adults mythologize, we talk about. But usually what kids are doing is they're maximizing their access to some of those nine things I talked about through that choice of peer group. 
So does your son find more of an adult identity with them? Does he find a, a more powerful identity? Does he feel like he's in more control of his life? Does he feel like he has more adventure, more risk? Does he feel he's treated more fairly by his peers? What is, why that group is he so attracted to? What is it, what's the cachet of that? Now once you've answered that question, if you can actually get that answer, then you're in a position to offer the substitution. And it's, it's, I often what parents do is they say, okay, no, 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 leave that group. Come back and play with this nice little group over here. And I, I worked with a girl just recently, and she did the same thing. The parents were saying, well, why are you hanging out with those druggies? This was their phrase. And she said, they're not druggies. They're interesting kids. You want me to hang out with the preps. You know what the preps are? Yeah. And she said that. And she said, and then she came in. So we were talking about this all with the parents in my office and stuff. And she said, Mike. The preps. My parents want me to hang out with the preps. And they said, yes, we'd like you to hang out with the preps. They're nice, they're clean cut and everything else. And she says, Dad, you don't understand. They are the most egotistical, arrogant, self-conceited bunch of bastards and bitches you've ever wanted. Why would I spend any time with them? At least these people over here, I don't actually hang out with the druggies who are doing drugs. I hang out with these kind of wannabe kids. And they're just cool and laid back and they're having fun and they, 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 they don't take themselves so seriously. Those preps, they... they they're always worried about their clothes and they're picking on each other and they're, you know, you're not my friend and you are and all this kind of crap. I don't want to be with them. So sometimes we have to understand it from the kid's point of view. What is your son looking for? And once you figure that out, where else could he get that? And if he can't get it through his peer group, the best um, pre prevention of future problems, give it to him in other places of his life. Get him involved in activities, that, that same power and control he might be looking for. If he's old enough, get him to start working. If he's old enough, get him to start controlling his own money. Get him traveling. Get him having adventures. Get him doing stuff that maybe, get him helping others so that the same things he finds in that group, he might also find in another way. That's great. Thank you very You're much. You're very welcome. Can I just say, I think there was, I just have time, I think, for one last question before we kind of wrap up here. Way back there, upstairs. Great. Hi. Have you have any insights into why there's more self-harm these days? Uh, self-harming behaviors. There's, um, well, the question is, is there more self-harming? Or is it different? Um, my inclination is, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think there's a little bit of certain types of self-harming behaviors the kids are picking up and mimicking each other. Um, but I don't know if it's more. I think there was other forms of self-harming behavior in our generation. We drank possibly more. Maybe we ran away from home. We had certain kinds of sexual behaviors. Uh, there was all kinds of things that we did that also were self-harming. But kids definitely are, you're seeing certain kinds of scarring behaviors, absolutely. Um, I think it kind of goes through groups. There's a little bit of a social desirability to certain kinds of behaviors I sometimes see. Um, and, you know, kids will latch on to out of the, you know, sort of feeling anxious, feeling trauma, feeling abuse. And they will simply find whatever is sort of in the media, whatever is current. Uh, they, will, they will often adopt that sets of behaviors. What you hear from kids, who, and some of you are in the psychology uh, fields or social, clinical social work and stuff, you know that kids who use those, say, self-scarring behaviors report that it reconnects them with their body. They've numbed out. They're traumatized. Um, now, why they're traumatized today more than others, I don't, I mean, that's a bigger conversation we're going to have here tonight but they have adopted that behavior as a way of coping with trauma, as a coping, you know, coping, and, it, and it's kind of handed to them. Every generation seems to choose a different specific type of self-harming behavior. There's no good answer to how you change it. You need clinical help. If you know a kid who's self-harming, it's best to sort of seek some sort of professional help to, 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 to lead the kid through that. Um, it's usually symptomatic of some trauma or uh, the kid looking for something. But by the way, even those kids, I will bring it around to what the topic for tonight is. A lot of those kids will, part of the healing process is to get them engaged with others and mostly to get them engaged to help others. Some of the, some of the kids who self-harm, we've actually got them helping other kids de-escalate their behavior as well. It's interesting, even the most disadvantaged or troubled kid still wants to actually reach out and help others. On that note, given time. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes if people did want to chat a little bit. And I know sometimes people have little questions. But let me simply say um, thank you very much again to the Commissioner for Children and Young People as well as the Minister. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. And all the best to you and your children and your families. Thank you.